Hi, my name is Martin Rooney. I'm a British 400 meter runner and 4x4 runner. Uh, I have been around a long time. Uh, I'm 33 years old now and I've been competing at an, uh, an elite level, I suppose, for since I was 18. And uh, I've been very fortunate to go to three Olympic Games. I've been to a, a quite a few world champs. I think I've got some kind of record there. And um, I, I, I'm still going. Uh, I've managed to win two European Championships and uh, I've had a, a good ride. Uh, I'm a, a 44-4 uh, runner at best. And it would be very nice to get somewhere within uh, at least half a second of that in in the next year or so. Um, my first question is, uh, you've competed at so many championships and international events, which has been your favorite meet venue and why? Um, it's just really tough because I have been doing it since I was 18. So I've competed at a lot of stadiums, a lot of championships. I think my favorite stadium is uh, the Bird's Nest in Beijing. Um, for me, it's perfect. I think there's quicker state, like quicker tracks out there. I think the surface is really good, but I think the whole environment, the whole, the way that the stadium's built, the the architecture of the stadium is like a stunning piece of architecture to look at. So every time I walk into it, I'm excited. I'm I'm, I'm pumped up to be there, and uh, just the way that you feel like you're in a cauldron when you're on track on the track, you look up and the stadium just keeps going up and up and up, and the people are on top of you rather than like a stadium like London where it doesn't really feel like it goes out and you can't really feel the back of the crowd. Whereas in Beijing, it just feels like everyone's on top of you. So I'd say Beijing, uh, Brussels, I love competing in Brussels. Um, and uh, they've, uh, those are probably two stadiums that have always been like my favorite, I think, to, to compete at. Um, and as a vet, as a meet, I'd say yeah, Brussels, the, the Diamond League Brussels is, it's never warm. <laughs> it's always a bit cold, but it's a, it's an event where the championships are done, and you just get people to run free. You get performance, some freak performances where people just come out and they've got no uh, no pressure, nothing to just they've just got to go out and run. And um, I've been very fortunate to win there. Uh, I think I got my first. I came second behind Jeremy Warren there the first time I went there, and then I managed to win uh, a national race against the Ball Ace there, which was uh, which was crazy. Have a 50,000 people going mad and some people booing when I won. But it was cool. <laughs> and I was very lucky to, like I said, I've been going for a long time. So it's probably stadiums that I'll think about later on and I'll be like, oh yeah, this one. Or well, this meet here. Um, so yeah, those are that's definitely two. Um, another question. Why do you wear sunglasses? Um, for me as a kid, uh, I was never, it might be hard to believe, I was never that cocky. Yeah, I remember that. Um, I was quite a shy kid, uh, a bit of an introvert. Uh, and I kind of had to learn to be this athlete who was kind of a bit, not, I suppose, arrogant. Um, and uh, I found that as a kid, when you saw other people wearing sunglasses, I was like, oh, that's that cocky person over there. And I, yeah, it's just kind of by accident. I raced in Beijing at the World Juniors and in the heats, I couldn't see. And luckily, uh, my sponsor at the time, Andy Des, had given me some sunglasses. So I wore my sunglasses in the heat and I was like, oh, this is amazing. I, I, I felt like a different person. I felt like I was, um, uh, I don't know, like uh, it just gave me a bit more power, a bit more, I don't know. It, it just changed my whole mentality from being this nervous kid to like very confident and it helped me kind of block everybody out. And um, yeah, I stuck with it. I stuck with it ever since. I think in the in the final, I didn't wear them and I didn't run that well. So uh yeah, it's become a bit superstitious about it. I, um, I've i tried to train and do like race pace stuff where I'm not wearing my glasses and I put my glasses on, I'm far more relaxed and I just know what I'm doing. Um, I even when I raced indoors for the one and only time last year, I didn't wear glasses there and I, I felt like uh, that might have made it a bit easier. I might have run a bit better if I'd had a pair of glasses on. So it's, it's definitely just a superstitious thing for me now, I think, um, performance-wise. If if that gives me one percent more, then yeah, I'll keep doing it. Keep doing it. Um, so yeah. Uh, question number three: You come across as someone who has put a lot of effort into your training over the years. What has motiv motivated you to keep up the same level of training with all the lockdown restrictions over the last year? Um, I suppose. 
some have put a lot of effort into training. I think that's kind of standard. I think uh, every elite athlete does. I don't think I hate the myth that like people like Bolt didn't train hard. Bolt trained really hard. Uh, you just don't always see it. And I think um, you don't get to any level without putting the work in. So I think it's just standard. I think like um, without sounding like Roy Keane and saying it's an insult to say that I train hard or whatever, um, it's, it's just normal. You go to any track around the country and everyone's training to the best of their ability. Um, and that's all I've done. I've just trained to the best of my ability and pushed myself as much as I could through COVID uh, and the lockdown. So I basically, I decided this is my opportunity to take a break. I looked at it uh, once the Olympics was postponed uh, and I knew that I didn't have to race. I'm not sponsored, so I don't have like restrict uh, contract obligations to fulfil. Uh, British Athletics UK Sport were happy for for me to take a break. I think because I like I have been doing it every year since I haven't missed a championship since I was well, I've seen a championship since I was 18, other than Delhi, which I chose not to go to. And um, I think it was just nice to have a summer off. It was nice to let my body kind of relax a bit. I, I helped Guy Leamont that in some of his sessions when he was in Loughborough last summer. Uh, I helped Jess Turner out with her workouts. I was here more as a as a, a pacemaker and I, I managed to get a lot of good fun stuff done and I kept myself motivated through that. And um, I was very fortunate I had access from uh, to the high pack at Loughborough University and I wasn't just going to go there and do nothing. So that's what I felt like if I can go pace those guys it gave me like a purpose and it gave, I could give something back and um, I think it helped them and it helped me. And I, I just enjoyed the whole thing of training again for the right, for a fun reason, rather than, right, I've got to go to this championship. So I've got to run this PB or whatever. So the motivation to carry on now, like having had that break is, is, is it's different. I'm a mate. I, I love it. I love training again. I love the training for me, training for my own goals. I've got my own personal goals that I'm working towards and that's all I'm thinking about this year. I'm not actually thinking about an Olympic Games or um, whether it's going to happen or whether it's not going to happen. I, I just want to go and race, even if it's uh, Charnwood Open in Loughborough or if I get lucky enough to go down to Corrie Marina or something like that. I just want to keep racing and I've got a target in my head that I want to hit and I think um, that's what's keeping me motivated and that's what's uh, that's what's my goal. Who's your favourite athlete to race against on anchor leg? Uh, and I guess you really want, <laughs> and I guess you really want on your podcast. Um, so who's my favourite person to race against? Kevin Borle. I love Ke racing Kevin Borle. Me and him go on really well. We have a good relationship. We've trained together in, uh, in on warm, warm weather camps. Um, we chat fairly regularly, um, and he's a, he's an exceptional relay runner. I think we both. Uh, we're pretty even on who's beaten each other over the years. Um, I'm pretty worried about them as a team now. <laughs> Belgium seem to have obviously the three Borlais and uh, Secor, the world junior champion. So they're very they're a huge threat to us. Uh, but I love running with him. Like if he's sitting on your shoulder, it's so scary because you know you know everything he's going to do. And if I'm sitting on his shoulder, he knows everything I'm going to do. And we just we're very I think we're very equal on what we do. And I think he's got a quicker split than me. Uh, 43 6 or something like that, but I think, uh, I think I've I could have gone a lot quicker on some relays, but anyway, um, he's uh, he's an exceptional athlete, and uh, yeah, just I really love racing against him. Like, if, I, if we're not in the race, I'll sell it, I'll cheer for them. So, when we went, when we got disqualified in Rio, I was cheering for the Belgian guys, so I really wanted them to pick up a medal, and uh, um, yeah, they've uh, they've been a great servant to Belgian and European sport. And who would I love to get on the podcast? Um, well, I've actually got a, a podcast with uh, the Borlais. Uh, I've got a big podcast, which I'm struggling to produce at the moment. It's, it's a lot of moving parts, but it's, uh, it's with uh, Kevin, Joe Borlais, Leslie Joan, David Gillick, and briefly Michael Bingham and myself. And it's uh, six of the eight who were in the 2010 European final in the 400, which was won by Kevin. And it was an amazing chat. Uh, but yeah, once I can finally, uh, we did it in the middle of the summer last year and it's, it's, really, it's actually killed my Mac, my computer at home. So uh, it's that much production that's going into it. Uh, so once I can get that sorted, uh, I'll get that out. And I think it's a brilliant pod. Um, you toyed with the idea of stepping up to the 800 a few years ago. 
or why do you why did you ultimately not make the change um as a kid i was a 800 1500 cross country runner who did the four by one and dropped into like pole vault mm -hmm. long jump whatever i was asked to do for my club and then i've kind of stumbled into the 400 and kind of got stuck in it i had uh, i had goals i wanted to break the european record i wanted to win medals at world level and i thought that i had the best opportunity to do that um in the 400 why didn't i step up to the 800 um probably because of the way i was just i was so focused on that goal i really wanted to run like 44 1 44 40 i had an, uh, in my head 44 11 was what i felt like um was there for me to to take and i haven't reached it so that's why i didn't move on to the 800 uh, and now i look at it um i look at the i think for a couple of years it was like it was kind of wasn't the strongest event we had michael rimmer do a great job for a while and then you had osaji and it was kind of just nothing really good people were satisfied with 145s or 146s and now you look at the talent there it's incredible and i think we've got guys who can really go to like the 143s and push on from there like like you look at like um dan Rowden, and guy learmoff jake Le um jake whiteman um they've seen charlie grice just run quick elliot giles carl langford there's so much talent there and i've probably missed out some guys and i apologize but there's so much talent there and it's exciting it's brit to be a british middle distance runner is an exciting thing at the moment and uh yeah it's just can i'm just going to be a fan and enjoy it from the outside uh what's the best bit of athletics advice you've ever had i suppose it's take every opportunity um i met uh i was very fortunate after i ran a, a british junior record in melbourne uh, I, I did a, a piece with uh, i think it was the times or telegraph or something one of the broadsheets and it was with roger black and i don't think roger black was very happy that i broke his record but <laughs> he just said to me like you just got to go for it. Like, don't worry about oh, people saying, oh, you're not ready to do things or you're not in, um, you've got, you got to take your time. Whatever you say, if you're already doing things now, go for it. Don't worry about what people say. And I think that was it. It was just like, take the opportunities that you're given um, and run with it. Don't be scared of it. Don't be, don't be thinking about, oh, I should do this. Uh, I need to appear, uh, I need to keep these people happy. Or whatever. It's just go for your opportunities and take it. So uh, I think that's the same in any walk of life. You just take the opportunities you're given. Uh, the best piece of advice I'd give you to somebody is to learn how to run properly. Um, I think that's something that definitely helped with my career later on. I didn't really, I don't think I really learned how to run until I was like 27. And I kind of wish I'd have learned if I'd have learned in my early twenties or late teens, uh, I could have had maybe more success. So I'd say take opportunity. Uh, my advice would be to learn how to run properly. And the best advice I got was, uh, take your opportunities. Um, if you could choose an ultimate 400 meter race to compete in, who would be in the other seven lanes? Wow. That, that would be cool to choose who you could race against. I, I suppose, um, I'd love to have raced Ewan. Never got to race against Ewan Thomas. Um, so that's one, uh, Wade Vanny Cook, uh, definitely put him in. He's an unbelievable athlete. Stephen Gardner, unbelievable athlete. That's free. Um, Cryony James. Cronin James is one of those people like you can't help but love the guy. So you race the guy, he's beating you by a half second, a second, whatever it is, and he's just, he comes over. Oh, thanks! It's an honour to race you today. <laughs> and you're like dying, and you're like you can't even be angry at the guy. You're like, yeah, what a guy, what a human. So yeah, Cronin James is definitely in there, and Wade's the same. Wade's exactly the same. He's just like it's an absolute pleasure to race you and all that kind of stuff. And I really enjoy being around those guys. Hopefully, I can get to that level again. So you got. Ewan Thomas, uh, Wade Van Niekirk, Stephen Gardner, um, Cryony James, myself. Um, the other three lanes, I would say, I would love to, Andrew Steele, great man that is Andrew Steele. I'd sneak him in there. He'd be great crack. And Carsten Warholm. I love Carsten Warren, just a fan, as an athletics fan. Him and Ry Benjamin, it's an amazing battle. Um, so I put him in. And who else? I'd say Fred Curley. I think I've probably said too many now. But anyway, I think those guys are all incredible athletes. Um, it's a privilege to have raced all of them, except from Ewan. Um, uh, but I'm very lucky that Ewan's someone that's accessible to every athlete. And 
he's been brilliant for me in my career. Uh, so it'd be nice to have a go at racing with him, or even just do a session with the guy. Anyway, I digress. Uh, what's the toughest training session and why? It's all relative, isn't it? Uh, for me, I love long sessions. I love the lactic tolerance stuff where you're busting out 300s or 450s or 350s, whatever. That's fine for me. Like it hurts and you get scared beforehand, but um, and there's a lot of pride involved, but it's it's okay. You know, you just you know you're going to get through it, and it's going to make you stronger. Um, for me, it's actually 80 meter runs, sprints like flat out sprints. It's something that I did a lot with Rainer. We did it once a week, and it'd be like eight times 80 meters. And for me, it was a huge learning curve. It was basically trying to get my central nervous system used to running at speed and handling speed, and um, it still kills me because it's just not the way my body's designed. But once you got more comfortable at doing the 80s at speed and being more comfortable at speed, I was able to run 21 by four and I was jogging um, just from being able to like handle my, my central nervous system firing better. And so to me, that's probably my hardest session, 80 meters flat out times eight. What is the technique? What is your technique to being consistent in training diet and how not to weigh yourself out mentally? I think the first thing is I love the sport. As an athlete, um, I'm a fan. Uh, I, I follow it. I enjoy uh, meeting new athletes and watching their development. And I've been fortunate to be at the front seat on the, for most of it, most of a lot of athletes' careers. Like I've kind of, especially in the British scene, I've kind of been very fortunate to go on camps and championships with young athletes and follow their journey. And that's something that's kept me motivated, just trying to like keep up with them or be ahead of them or whatever, whatever it may be. But it's just something that's... Um, definitely kept me mentally in the sport uh, my diet that's definitely something i've had to uh, alter as i've got older I, I had a terrible diet as a kid um sugar sugar has always been my nemesis and i realized as i've got older i can't just keep piling away chocolate bars and stuff it doesn't work uh i think last summer when i did take uh, type the easier summer i kind of indulged in everything so I really enjoyed myself, <laughs> let myself go. And then I realized when I came to training, I had to look, kind of work it all off. Um, so my diet is quite, not strict now, but it's just about uh, cutting my, the amount of food I was eating. Uh, I have quite a healthy diet, I'd say, relatively. It's just like meat, veg, carbs. It's nothing to, there's no science in it for me. It's just uh, making sure I'm not eating too much and not, um, not snacking a lot. Uh, replacing the snacks with protein shakes or, um eating like a protein uh, like a if i'm gonna have a snack it's got to be something solid so like i'll have like a, a yogurt with granola and raisins and a bit of honey so it's just nothing nothing special in my diet it's just um knowing when i've had too much and at the moment i'm probably as light as i've been for a couple of years um skin folds are at a good level so i'm pretty pretty happy uh what was the other question of that? What is your technique of being consistent in training? Consistent, um, I don't think I've ever, the consistency in training is, is, is a tough thing to have. Like I think for me, it's just about staying healthy. Uh, the, the, song, the longer I stay healthier, the, far, the better I train, the longer I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the right frame of mind to train as well. And so that's where I, I get my performances from. If I can have eight months where I'm training injury free, I run well. If I have two months, I'm not, at my age now, no, it's not going to work. So I have to be consistently healthy and um, that's always going to be my focus at the moment. And with two young kids, it's uh, avoiding sniffles and colds and flus and stuff like that. Uh, next question. Uh, do you consider it important to do a lot of 200 meter races in preparation for a 400 for the speed aspect? Um, yes and no. I think it's doing what's right for you as an athlete. Like, so for me, uh, I don't race many 200s, but I will do a lot of stuff in training where I'm running good quality 200 meter reps, uh, trying to hit just ahead of race pace. Um, I think sometimes when I've tried to go and race hard, I've run tense and you don't get the results that you're capable of. Like I know I'm not a speed athlete, but I know I'm probably a 20.6, 20.7, 200 meter runner at my best. Uh, but it, I'm never going to do that in a race because I'm going to try and do this and fight all the way down, <laughs> fight the 200 meter runners, which is never going to happen. But um, 
I think uh, for me personally, I don't uh, believe that's what I need to do. I know a lot of other athletes do it and I know a lot of, uh, sorry, <laughs> glutted all over again. No, um, sorry. Uh, I know a lot of other athletes do run the 200 and that's what they need to do to, to get themselves ready for a four. But I think for me, as long as I've got my 400 meter race rhythm down, that's a cool, I, I can run, as long as I can run 21, 21 four to 21 six and be comfortable. Uh, that's what that's my focus um da -da -da -da. right which international medal is the most significant to you um that's a weird that's a tough question i've got not as much medals as i'd like um uh, but i suppose the ones that I, i've got a fair few and the ones that probably mean the most is i've got two uh zurich 2014 for me, it was my first championships that I won, I won and ran. I didn't run a, the, as fast as I was probably capable of but that year, but I, was, I ran the right race to win. So it meant like a lot to go and just get it done on the day. Um, and uh, yeah, it was nice. I, I wasn't the favorite going into it. So it was nice to, and it, I think a couple of things went against me going into it. I think it was my third championships as well that year. So to win that championships was massive. And then Beijing 2015 to when we got a, a, a bronze medal in the relay. My wife had given birth to our first child, Jack, uh, on the same day as the 400 meter final. So uh, I had to come home with a medal. Otherwise, it's, it's a long way. <laughs> like you're missing the birth of your, of your first born child. You come away from that championships without a medal. Uh, it's kind of a hard one to explain. So uh, to come away with the medal was massive, and we earned it. We were, we fought two for now for that uh, for that medal, and I was very lucky to uh, to come away not empty-handed. I'm gonna have to close the curtain. Back in a sec. There you go. Back again. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, those are the two best medals. Uh, best training session you've ever done. Um, I don't know. I've done some good sessions. I suppose with Verena, um, I had three frees and they were at race pace and it was like off 10 and both of it meant to be off 10 minutes. So I went, I think like 32 high on the first one. 10 minutes later, I went 33 low and I was done. I thought this is it. So I took about 15 minutes. <laughs> my shoes off and everything i go over to rain and it's like right on this one you want, i want you to get out and be I was like, oh damn it i was done <laughs> but i ended up running another 33 low um it was just off race pace in the end but free runs uh i think the i must have had about 18 minutes uh between the second and the third run that's that's pretty good going for a guy who's not a 30 i'm not a 31 second run i'm a 32 flat at best so to be nearly at max uh over 300 meters is it was, it was tough but i really enjoyed it i had dwight phillips uh watching my session and time in my session as well which was quite cool we were at the img academy in florida and when you've got a, um, a, a goat an og watching your session it's kind of it's a little bit more nerve-wracking and stuff but I, I um it's something i remember fondly I've dropped down from the middle distance as running 40, 400, 800 at 56 and have been training for this over the last two years. So my question is, how much is it going to hurt in a 400 meter race? And when does that hurt start to kick in? Um, well, if, it depends on your training. It could hurt like in the first 10 meters and then you've got a long way to go. I, I've definitely raced, got out and been like, whew. I've done it a couple of times at the British Champs where I've just not, I've not been 100% and you go there and you get, I think at literally like 60 meters, you're like, this is going to be a long way. Uh, and uh, I think with your 800 background and strength background, it will probably come on later. But it's just how, how hard you're willing to go. If you're willing to go flat out through the first 250, 300 meters, then it's going to hurt a lot. But that's up to you. And that's your individual race plan. If you can find a way that suits you as a, a middle distance runner coming down where maybe you run a more even pace race, that's uh you might stave off the pain for longer but i wish you well 
and good luck. And uh, if I'm still able to move at 56 years old, uh, if I'm still able to jog up and down, I'll be very happy. You always appear inc incredibly supportive of your teammates in the relay. How much has that camaraderie meant to you in maintaining your love for the 400 meter running? Um, yeah, I love the relay. I'm, I'm not shy to say that. I, I love being part of a team. It's something that, um, I, it's something that's, I'm better at. I am a better relay runner than I'm an individual runner. It's, I think it's coming out of blocks. Maybe I'm just not that good at that, or uh, or maybe it's just being around other people and fighting for each other. I feel like it. I'll always work. I'll always give everything to the guys. I'll always put my my heart and soul into it. And I think my whole thing is I want everybody else on the team to do that. And that, that the most frustrating part of it is when you get some people who don't commit to it the same way that you do. Um, and that's always hard to deal with. I think uh, if you've got three guys in the team who are working that for everything, they're just pushing it and they're willing to get to, to put everything on the track and you get one person who's not, that's that's when we don't win medals. <laughs> so uh, I love being a part of a team. I love being a uh, part of a group of six, six athletes because uh, it's not just the, the strike four, it's the people behind the scenes as well who are all willing to give everything for each other. And at the end of the day, it's a, it's a it's a privilege. We're very fortunate to represent our country at the top level. We're very um, proud to be a British athlete and proud to represent us on the global stage. And um, so that's, I kind of, I want everybody else to buy into that. And when people do buy into it, we get success. Um, I think the, the most gutting one was when in Rio, like we ran so well against all the odds. Like I think we got lane one in the heat. Um, Rabbi Yusuf had had an incredible training camp and then picked up an injury just before he came to Rio, it was very unfortunate. Um, so to lose, like I'd say, he was myself, him, and and uh, Matt together. We could and Delano doing what Delano was doing. It was very tough, like to lose him. Uh, Nigel obviously stepped up and did an amazing job as well. But uh, that camaraderie he had there was was amazing, amazing to be a part of. And I think we were ready to do big things. So yeah, I, I just I, I invest in the team, and hopefully they give it back to me in good. Uh, high performance uh, if you could become Olympic champion in any other sport what sport would you choose if I could choose a sport to be Olympic champion in I'd say rowing um, I think rowing is one of those sports where they all <laughs> you, you do well in that rowing and then you've got a job for life something else so that's me just thinking in the future I'd be like well okay cool I'll do my job in, as a rower for maybe 10 years and then I'll walk into a job at, uh, at one night I've got an education at um, one of the high-end universities and uh, <laughs> this is me being selfish really but I think it's just looking into the future rowers seem to look after themselves look after the the, the squad um, I have one more question which came on a, another platform uh, if I could choose my British all-time four by four who would it be of people that I've ran with? Um, so I'd always put Rabbi Yusuf on first. I think Rabbi Yusuf in 2015 did an amazing job. Like he'd ran five races, he made the individual final and he came to the final, he dropped another, like he just did a job for us. It was incredible. Um, and he was, I'd love to get that kind of Rabbi, 2015 Rabbi Yusuf, put him on first leg. Second leg would be, it's quite a tough one. I don't, it's between... Delano Williams and um, Dwayne Cowan. So Delano in Rio ran, I think it was like 44-0. Uh, but the way he did it, it was like as if he was a pro. He'd been doing it for years and he was, he just schooled people like Chris Brown and Jonathan Borle and he was like, it was incredible. Uh, whereas then Dwayne Cowan, we didn't, we wouldn't have won a bronze medal in London without the way that Dwayne Cowan ran. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Delano just because it was just like uh, the way that the guys that he took out was incredible. And it was a shame that we didn't get to uh, really celebrate how well he ran. Uh, third leg, Tim Benjamin. Every day of the week, that guy was in my squad. He is, he really gave me the right advice in the right way as an 18 year old when, we, when I went to Helsinki. He really bucked my ideas up. And it wasn't soft and pansy. It was like he drove me in the right way. He, he gave me. Uh, kind of a telling off, but it's what I needed as an 18-year-old. And he helped guide me through the whole 
uh, World Championships experience, and he was the person who, who was the British number one at the time. He didn't. He done so well individually that year. He didn't really need to be focused on the relay, but he was desperate for a team medal. He desperately wanted to win uh, a medal for us as a squad. So he kind of set the tone for me, and I've kind of just felt like I'm trying to carry it on. So I'd put him on third leg, and then I'd go fourth. Um, but yeah, that would be my strike four.